What is the creepiest experience that has ever happened to you or somebody else? I rented a cabin for a week with my significant other. The first night there, we spent the day visiting her family, the actual reason for a trip, and had dinner. She got pretty hammered. When we got back to the cabin and carried my significant other inside to find all our bags opened and dumped onto the floor, this put me in panic mode. I hadn't been drinking, I routinely carry it, so I pulled out my gun and swept the house. I checked every room, closet, and even under the bed, but nothing. My significant other was still fast asleep, so I checked her stuff over and nothing was missing. It had just been dumped onto the floor. So I looked around some more, all the windows were locked, and the back door was even dead bolted. It just really bothered me that there was no sign of a break-in. I know I locked the place before I left, so either someone else had a key to my cabin or whoever it was was still inside the cabin. Either way, I didn't think I'd do much sleeping. It was too late to make other arrangements, considering that most likely there wasn't really anything to worry about. we had been gone all day from 9am to midnight, so odds were, whoever it was, it was probably way earlier. But still, I couldn't shake it. I went in and covered up my significant other, used the bathroom, and set up a rocking chair facing the front door. My hand with my gun on my lap, I started watching. I felt pretty silly sitting there, but I could not sit there either. And sometime around 3 to 4 a.m., I fell asleep. I woke up the next morning around 7 a.m. with the sun shining through. I actually half scared myself because I hadn't mean to fall asleep, which then scared me again because I wasn't holding my gun. I started looking around, and on the couch was my gun. I'm like, what? Then I looked, and the front door was wide open. I'm like, no way. I jumped up and started running to check on my SO. Thank God she was still there, untouched. I went back out into the living room and picked up my firearm. All my bullets were missing. I went outside and looked around. The car and everything were still there. There were no signs of anyone. I went back inside, looked in the far corner of the living room, and saw the rug lifted from the corner of the main living room. I investigated and found that it's covering the opening to the crawl space. That means this guy was in my cabin the entire time. I must have pulled up and caught the guy in the act. He thought fast and hid in the crawl space. And sometime during the night, crawled out, disarmed me, and walked right out the front door. Story 2 My mom worked at Tampa General Hospital in the 1980s on the graveyard shift with like four other women and one guy. In 1984, a psychopath started a spree during the summer, and his victims were women. I think they were later discovered to be call girls. My mom and her co-workers were all in their 20s at the time, so after one of the incidents made the news again, they got nervous about having to walk back to their cars at the end of their shift in the middle of the night. So the one male co-worker, Bobby Joe Long, walked into the parking garage, my mom included. A few weeks later, Long was arrested and charged with all the cases after one of his intended victims escaped. So yeah, that one's a little freaky. My mom had this fascination with psychopaths. Seriously, she had a book on the 100 most famous ones in American history. So she loved telling that story. She told me for the first time when I was quite young and she had a little trouble understanding why I didn't think it was such a cool story. Alright, I'm confused. How does someone with so many convictions get a job in a hospital? Don't they do background checks or something? Story 3 When I was in third grade, my parents had just begun letting me stay home alone when they went grocery shopping and whatnot. One day around 2 in the afternoon, the doorbell rings, and I get this weird feeling. Normally, I would have jumped up and over the door, thinking it'd be one of my friends wanting to play, but I crawled up the stairs to go look over the railing, where you can see who it is at the door downstairs. Halfway up the stairs, the person starts fiddling with a doorknob and banging up against the door. I start freaking out and immediately freeze like a deer in the headlights. When he started banging the door some more, I crawled up enough so that I could see who he was. It was some 20-something looking thug, dressed in black pants, a black hoodie with a hood up, and what looked like a ski mask on top of his head, but not pulled over his face. He had one shoulder braced against the door and one hand fiddling with a knob. His other hand, which I could see, was holding a firearm that was halfway concealed in his front hoodie pocket. I started crying, just frozen there, thinking that I would never see my mom, dad, or babysitter again. Eventually, he looked up, noticed my face barely peeking up over the stairs, and stared at me. I freaked out and dove back down, and when I looked up, he was gone. I found out later the next day that three houses and two cars had been broken into in our section of the neighborhood. Story 4 I was walking home from a pub in the city when I saw a car pull up next to a hammered girl who was sitting in the gutter. Something just didn't feel right about this situation. So I walked over just as she was getting into the car and asked her if she was okay, I was on the passenger side with the door open, and the girl was leaning in, talking to the driver as he was telling her to get in the car. He kept saying he was a taxi, urging her to get in the car. When he started reaching for her hand to pull her in, I looked at him, and he was sweating and staring at me. He looked me in the eye and said, I am taxi. That's when I noticed that there were two other men in the back seat of his car, all staring at me and the girl. The driver got a hold of the girl and started to pull her into the car when I grabbed her and told her he wasn't a taxi, all the while he's got this crazed look in his eyes, and he just keeps saying, I am taxi, over and over again. I took the girl away from the car and the men started to speak in a foreign language and then began to shout at me. I told the girl I would call her a taxi, but that car wasn't a taxi. It had no radio, meter, markings, license, etc. 
Plus, there were two men in the back. The facts seemed to dawn on her and sober her up. The men in the car drove off and I took a picture of their license plate and tried to get a picture of them. Wow. Props to this dude for stopping a real-life taken situation. Story 5. My coworker told me this once, and thinking about it still sent shivers down my spine. One night she realized that she was down to only one cigarette. So, she decided to walk on down to the little corner mart that was located just a few streets down from her apartment building. If I remember correctly, she said that the sun had just started to set. So by the time she got to the store, bought the cigarettes, and started walking back home, it was dark out. The weather that week had been crappy, so it was somewhat foggy that night. But she wasn't too scared because this was a place she was familiar with and felt safe in. She said that about five minutes into the walk home, she heard footsteps behind her. She didn't think anything of it at first, but when she could still hear the footsteps after five more minutes, she began feeling slightly anxious. She suddenly became very aware of how dark it was outside now and how empty the street she was on seemed. Then she heard a faint voice from behind her, where the footsteps had been. Whoever was following her started to sing. rock baby from the treetop. At this point, she said she was in full panic mode. So she started to pick up her pace. The person behind her followed suit and the footsteps moved quickly. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. She finally made it back to her apartment building and yanked open the door of the lobby as fast as she could. The footsteps had stopped. She sprinted up the stairs to her apartment and looked out the window to see if the person was still there. Outside in the courtyard, she could make out the faint shape of a man's figure. Standing there looking up right at her window, she said he stayed there like that for a good ten minutes before walking off. Ever since this incident, if she needs cigarettes, she's had her son give her a ride to the store. Story 6 I was almost abducted one time when I was in 6th grade. I just left my front yard, walking on my way to my friend's house one day, when suddenly, this dude driving down the street in a white van slammed on his brakes, got out of the van, and started running straight at me. Luckily, I didn't wait to watch him get out of the van. As soon as I heard the tire screech, I did an about face, hauled myself, and slammed into my front door. My mom heard the screech of the tires, and luckily for me, practically opened the door when I slammed into it. I turned around to look at the guy who had frozen on the sidewalk. The dude had the nerve to say sorry before hurrying back to the van to speed off. I guess it didn't count on me being right in front of my house and not being a kid walking down the street far from home with nowhere to run. Another story I have is when I was forced to give a ride to a criminal one night after getting off work at 2am. I was completely alone in an empty parking lot and he approached from behind a building as I opened my car. I offered the car but he didn't want it. He only wanted to ride and the threat was implied. His hands and face were stained and he said he had just been jumped. I didn't see much choice so I gave him a ride. It turned out okay but I called 911 when I got home. A detective came the next day and took a statement. Years later, another detective came to get another statement. Turns out he may have been involved in a robbery. So many years had passed, I couldn't remember much detail. Don't know what happened after that. The funny thing is, I wasn't very scared because I think I was in shock. When I got home and told the story, everyone started freaking out, and I got scared. Either that guy was really hurt or he just didn't know how to drive. Man, these situations are tough, and I wouldn't know what to do if it were me in them. The good thing is that I'm just reading and learning from them. If you want to learn more, smash that like button and subscribe to my channel. I have more videos like this. Story 7 It happened on a stormy morning in February, several years ago. I live in Arizona, and that night we had some thunderstorms which caused our phones to malfunction. I just woken up for school, and Mom decided that she would use her cell phone to call her home phone to see if the phone line was working yet. So she went into the garage, got her cell phone from her car, and called. The phone rang. I answered, and oddly, her answering machine started to record the call. This is what happened next. Me. Hello? Typical phone recording. We're sorry, your call could not go through. Would you please hang up and try again? I knew the answering machine was recording because I could hear myself on it, so I thought it would be funny to act like I was mouthing off to the we're sorry recording. Me. No. Typical phone recording. We're sorry. Me. Yeah, I'm sure you're sorry. It's all your fault. I hung up and decided to listen to the recording. And this is what I heard. Keep in mind that I was talking to a typical audio recording for a failed call. Typical phone recording. We're sorry your call could not be completed as dialed. Will you please hang up and try again? Me. No. Typical phone recording. We're sorry. Me. Yeah, I'm sure you're sorry. Think you're funny? It's all your fault. And between my senses, something legitimately asked me. Think you're funny? It was in this horrible, raspy, hissing-sounding voice. It was terrifying. And it still gives me the creeps knowing that someone asked me such a mean, evil-sounding question. So what did I do? I grabbed my Kevin McAllister issue of Talkboy and recorded it. Story 8. Back in high school, a few friends and I decided we were going to spend Halloween night in this creepy cemetery located in a country road miles away from anything else. This place was old. When we were scouting the location earlier in the week, we noticed quite a few of the graves were from the late 1800s. But there were also a few graves dating to the early 2000s. In front of the cemetery is a church with a historic landmark plaque out front. 
giving details about the history of the location and whatnot. This church had burned down at one point and had also been destroyed by a storm at one point. If my memory serves me right. Anyway, here comes Halloween night and we're all ready to go with flashlights, blankets, snacks, and our phones. We pull into the cemetery around 10 p.m. There's only one light outside of this church and it illuminates the driveway. There isn't a parking lot, just a small loop back out to the road and the three cars we drove pretty much filled this loop. We got out of the cars and started walking the short pathway to the cemetery. There was a chest-height iron gate that you had to open to get into the cemetery. It wasn't very heavy, but it made a pretty loud screeching noise when you opened it. One of my friends, we'll call him T, decides we should take audio recordings while we're there like ghost hunters do. We all thought it would be pretty cool at the time as well. So T and I started recording on our phones as we walked into the cemetery. T says, Is anybody there? And we walk inside. One of our friends, we'll call him H, gets cold and starts looking pale when he walks inside and decides it's time for him to leave. He goes home, but the rest of us are determined to stay. T keeps asking more random questions that we hope to get answers to. And we eventually decide to call it a night around 2 a.m. When we got back to my place, I started to listen to the recordings. Two things freaked me out. Number one, the gate slams shut as we're walking towards it. Number two, when T asks if anybody's there, you hear a voice say, Get out! in a very angry tone. We only went back once after that, and more creepy stuff happened that time. So I avoid that entire road now. It creeps me out. Story 9 One night I was lying on the couch watching TV. Everyone else was already asleep. Our living room had a big window right behind the TV, which looked out to the patio. As I was laying there, I suddenly caught, out of the corner of my eye, a man's face pressed right up against the window, staring at me with this wide-eyed, crazed expression. I held my panic down surprisingly well. I just sort of calmly got up and walked to my brother's room and got him to look outside to see if anybody was there. And of course, it wasn't. In the morning, I went out to the patio to see if there were, I don't know, footprints or something. I immediately noticed that the patio table was shoved up against the wall below the window. There were nose and forehead prints in the glass. For someone to be in a position to make those prints, he would have to be on top of the table on his hands and knees, with his face pressed against the glass, looking at me the night before. Is it just me? I find the story reminds me of Jack Nicholson. Story 10. This happened circa 1971 or 1972. The incident occurred in a heavily wooded area near Montevallo, Alabama. My mother is the oldest of five children. She has three sisters and a brother who is the baby of the family. One weekend in the cooler months of the fall, my grandfather decided to take the whole family. My grandmother, my mother, and all my aunts and uncles, so seven people total, into the woods for target practice with a firearm. My mother grew up quite poor and they didn't always live in the best neighborhoods, so my grandfather wanted to teach the kids how to defend themselves with a rifle if need be. Like I said, it was later in the fall, so the trees were bare and there were lots of leaves in the ground. The wooded area was just off a dirt road. Since it was so far off the beaten path, my grandfather was startled when he heard the roar of a car engine so deep in the woods. My mom remembers the car as being a blue Ford Galaxy. Even though my grandfather had a weapon, he freaked out and told my grandma and the kids to hide under a pile of leaves in the woods. He hid with them. The man in the driver's seat got out, dragged something out of the car, and just dumped it there in the woods and drove away. After my grandfather was sure the man had gone, everyone came out of hiding. What the man dumped sat up and stared them straight in the face. My grandfather asked the woman if she needed help. She said no, she would be fine. She didn't seem to be injured, and she didn't want help. She didn't put up a fight with the man when he was dragging her out of the car, so my grandfather cut the shooting lesson short and decided to rush the kids home to safety. Well, on the trail back to the dirt road, they passed the man in the blue Ford Galaxy driving out of the woods. My mom looked over and noticed that he had a huge machete lying across the front seats right beside him. My grandfather made sure that the man could see that he was carrying a rifle. The man struck up a small talk with my grandfather and asked him how he was doing and what they were doing out in the woods. My grandfather explained that he had just taken his family out for some target practice with a rifle. The man told him to have a nice day and continue driving. The next day, my grandfather went back out to that spot in the woods. There was nothing there. However, he did find the woman's wig, her purse, some Kleenex, and a pair of eyeglasses. He collected the items and took them home. According to my grandfather, that area of the woods was known for having shallow graves and being a dumping site. My mother became hysterical when he walked in the door carrying that stuff. My grandfather ended up taking the items to the police station, but my mom doesn't think anything ever came of it. Well, she did hear one other thing about it, I guess. Early the next morning, my grandmother called my mom when she arrived at work, just before the kids left for school. She told them not to take the bus that day and that she would come home, pick them up, and drive them to school. When my mom asked why, my grandmother said, because that car is waiting for you at the bus stop. Story 11 A childhood friend of mine was in a car accident many years ago. She was driving in the rain at night and fiddling with a radio when she hydroplaned into a tree. The impact knocked her unconscious, and when she woke up, she could see her taillights through the windshield of her car. This happened in a somewhat isolated road, when she was in a dark green car that was almost impossible to see, especially down in a ravine and wrapped around a tree on a rainy evening. But luckily for her, a close friend of hers happened to pass by with his dad and saw the exhaust from her car and dialed 911. The car was twisted around like a tin can. 
The first responders had to use the jaws of life to remove her from the vehicle, and she was in such bad shape that they called her parents to the scene of the accident to say their goodbyes in case she did not make it to the hospital. They performed emergency surgery at the hospital, but were unable to find all the sources of what happened to her internally. She was too unstable for them to operate anymore. She was not expected to make it through the night. A few hours later, the hospital received a call from one of their top surgeons, who had been on a long vacation out of town. He asked if the hospital had received any critical patients that night, and they were like, wait, aren't you still away on vacation? It turns out that this particular surgeon had gotten a really bad feeling while away on his trip and said he felt a strange, unexplainable urge to return to the hospital. So he cut his vacation with his family short and went back home. That was the surgeon who saved her life. The doctors also told her that she would need dialysis for the rest of her life and that she would probably never be able to have children. She was on dialysis for five weeks total and is now in her 30s with three kids of her own. I hope you enjoyed the video. And if you made it this far, I'm sure you'll also enjoy. What's the creepiest thing that ever happened to you? Story 4 screams crazy. See you in that video.